And a very warm welcome to the LBC Book Club. With me this week, Sir Roderick Braithwaite, who was a British ambassador in Moscow between 1988 and 1992, and various other places as well, is with me in the studio. Good evening. Good evening. And he's written an absolute doorstop of a book. How many pages is it? 415 pages. It's called, a- I can't say this properly, Afghansi. Afghansi. And it's the Russians in Afghanistan, 1979 to 89, all about the Soviet occupation obviously has a lot of uh, relevance to what's happening today. Um, Afghansi, explain. Well, Afghansi is what the veterans, the, the Soviet veterans, call themselves, and it's from the Russian word meaning an Afghan, uh, a native of mm. Afghanistan, and it also is a particularly nasty, hot, dry wind, which is also called... Oh, is it? I didn't know that. that. And, uh, but that's how they refer to themselves, the veterans, when they're talking about themselves or to one another. Now, you've, you've written several books about uh, Russia. This, yeah. This, this is the latest. Um, what, what made you want to write about the Soviet occupation? Well, I didn't want to write about the Soviet occupation. I wanted to write about what it says, the Russians in Afghanistan. Mm. Let's say, what, it was, what was it like for those people, the soldiers, the women who went there to work, the aid workers yeah. who went there to work, a whole lot of people piled in. They were there for more than nine years. And what was it like? And uh, I started from the assumption that it was it was a war, like any other war, no worse and no better. And what was it like for those conscripts and people who mm. went through that war? So I spent a lot of time talking to them and tried, you know, as a foreigner, it's difficult, but tried to give, as it were, what it felt like to them, that war. Well, let's give the whole discussion a bit, bit of context, um, first of all. What led to the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in December 1979? I mean, I can remember that. Well, how old was I then? About 19. And, I mean, it, it really was a, a massive news event, wasn't it? It was a massive news event, which was made more... I was uh, not 19 at the time, <laughs> but I was working in the Foreign Office, and we were among other things, churning out the propaganda. Yeah. And so it, we largely misrepresented what they were doing. They were not invading an innocent country in order to take it over mm. and set up a Soviet port in the Indian Ocean and all the things we said. But had you seen it coming? People, I wasn't dealing with people had seen it. Well, what people knew was that something was going on and um, the CIA knew that the Russians were moving troops around, but nobody knew whether they were going to move in or not, or, or if they did, why. And one reason why was that the Russians themselves didn't make up their minds till the last minute because they definitely didn't want to go in. They decided nine months earlier that they would not send troops to Afghanistan because they'd get mixed up in somebody else's civil war. Mm. It's always a bad formula. <laughs> and, uh, and then, step by step, they were sort of bamboozled and trapped into going in. And so they went in. They sent special forces to kill the president and impose a new president of their own. They went in with the intention of stabilising the government, training up the army and police, and leaving within six months. It's all year. sounding terribly familiar, this. Well, people... <laughs> it's, it's like adolescents. They always repeat their parents' mistakes. Right. And um, how easy was it at the beginning? Because obviously, I mean, it got mired um, later on, but, I mean, initially, did, did, did it work? Well, it worked in, in, the, in the simplest sense that... Um, uh, they went in, they uh, deployed their troops, they overthrew the previous government, and initially they were welcomed. I mean, one guy I, I talked to was in the Soviet embassy in Kabul, and his ambassador sent him and others who could speak the local language to ask people what they thought. And what they say is, we're very glad that you got rid of that bastard who was in charge, but we've got a piece of advice for you, which is you better leave very soon, otherwise you'll be unpopular too. Mm. And they didn't. And why was Afghanistan so important to the Soviets? Well, it, it's, uh, it was bang on their frontier. I mean, it was, it was a neighbouring country. It was in turmoil. They were afraid that the Americans, the Americans were being thrown out of Iran at the very same time. They were afraid the Americans would move their in, intelligence assets into Afghanistan and threaten them. It was bang next to their nuclear testing ground. And I don't think the Americans intended to do that, but the Cold War was going on. We all thought it the worst possible uh, the, the other side was motivated by the mm. worst possible motives. And so I think it really was a defensive move. And what was the reaction of the West? I mean, it was, I remember Margaret Thatcher being uh, quite vituperative about it, as, as she might well have been. Um, but what, what's the reaction of the Americans? Well, the Americans, uh, the Americans had just had the humiliation of 
Iran. Carter said, people think I was wet about Iran. I can show you, I can tell you, I'm not going to be wet. I'm going to show them. So there was that. Um, there was the feeling that the, the Russians had got themselves into a mess and that the Americans could get their own back for, for Vietnam. I mean, a very, similar, mm. a very similar kind of war 10 years earlier, and the Americans were still yeah. smarting, and they thought, now, now let the Russians feel what we felt. And it was the Cold War going on. I mean, you always exploited the uh, mistakes of the other side. Um, so there was a very effective propaganda campaign mounted against the Soviets, there were quite a few people inside the Soviet establishment who thought they were making a huge mistake right from the beginning. And, of course, they were. Mm. And what about, I mean, a lot of the book is, as, as you said, about the human stories. Just give us some, paint some pictures of some of the stories that you tell in the book. Well, of course, it was a conscript army, and that's a great difference from what we have today. It's much more like the Americans in Vietnam. So... These guys would go for 18 months to two years, and they'd be mostly, uh, if you had any influence, if you were a Russian, you were in the elite, you made sure your son didn't go to Afghanistan. So most of the people in the army were um, from poor, poor urban families or from the countryside, and they were very simple people. Um, uh, and they, uh, they went off in this army, which was in many ways a good army, but... Uh, good fighting army, but it was very badly organized in other ways. I mean, the health problems they had were appalling. There was a lot of bullying went on between the soldiers, and it was very, very tough. And some people broke, of course, but others didn't. And talking to people, I was surprised that several of them said their years in Afghanistan were the best years of their lives, which is difficult to imagine, except, of course, they were young then, now they're not. So they're mm. looking back on their youth, partly. Mm. And they were... They were fascinated by the country. They go back. I mean, Russians who fought there go back as tourists, and they take films and put them on, on uh, YouTube. You can find them. Uh, so there's a sort of nostalgia for this exotic country, and it is a very beautiful country, and it was an exciting period, and they survived. Mm. Uh, not so good for the ones who lost their legs. How many Soviet soldiers were there at any one time? Well, a, the maximum was of Soviets altogether was 120,000, but it was uh, between 120,000 down to 80,000. We now have 132,000, so we've got more than they had. And they, like us, they went in in order to build a new society, and they had lots of aid workers, and they had lots of projects, irrigation projects, and factory projects, and schools. They built a lot of schools and hospitals. Um, so they did try to do something positive, and of course it didn't work. And what kind of resistance was there to them? Well, it, there had been fighting before they turned up. There was uh, uh, the communists, the Afghan communists took over in April 1978 and immediately there was, a, there was opposition to them and a lot of fighting started because they were atheists and the ordinary people in the countryside weren't prepared to put up with that. So the civil war had started really a year before they got there. And they came into a civil war and so they went in believing they wouldn't fire a shot. If you remember, we went into Hellman thinking we weren't mm. going to fire a shot. And the shot started very soon, and they found themselves having to fight back, um, really within a month or two. Uh, that, that, that quickly? Yeah. And, I mean, as time went on, I suppose it, it got worse with the, the, the strengthening of the Mujahideen, which I, I guess were financed by Western influences cia presumably the cia poured huge sums of money i mean millions and millions and millions of dollars into arming the mujahideen um and uh, they fought very well of course the mujahideen but they were very divi divided amongst themselves and once the russians left they started a new civil war they started killing one another and kabul for example was destroyed after the russians had left in the civil war that followed and uh, for a lot of afghans the arrival of the taliban was a great relief because they brought, mm. brought law and order. I mean, they discovered it wasn't quite that simple after a little, yeah. fairly quickly, but, but they did bring the civil war to an end. 
Well, you're listening to the LBC Book Club with me, Ian Dale. I'm talking to Sir Roderick Braithwaite about his book, Afghansi, The Russians in Afghanistan, 1979 to 89. It's published by Profile Books, £25 in hardback. We'll talk to Sir Roderick a little bit uh, more in a couple of minutes' time. Just to tell you, by the way, that next week on the book club, we have an hour with Peter Mandelson talking about his memoirs, just come out in paperback with a, an extra chapter and an extra preface, which actually I'd better get hold of that because I've read the hardback, but um, I think he said a, f- a few things about Ed Miliband that I might want to ask him about. The time now is quarter to ten. And here's Alan Joyce with the travel. Thanks, Ian. The A41. Is- and you're listening to the LBC Book Club. Uh, so, Roderick Braithwaite's with me, the author of Afghansi, The Russians in Afghanistan, 1989 to... Sorry, 1979 to 89. Um, we're, we're just waiting for the vote in the House of Commons on the, um, on the Libyan debate, which is going on at the moment. And, of course, today, um, we, we, it's been very interesting because the Russian president, Dmitry Medvedev, has said that Vladimir Putin's description of the UN resolution on Libya is unacceptable... Is it in itself unacceptable? And that's the first time, Roderick, that I've actually ever heard Medvedev taking issue with Putin. Well, I think it's the first time I've heard it too, and I've, I know no more than you do about mm. the circumstances in which he said that. Um, so I can't speculate very far. I mean, normally the enthusiasm with which the foreign observers try and find a gap between Putin and Medvedev in order to work out which of them is going to be president after mm. next year, I think it's a waste of time. I mean, you know, there'll be a vote and it'll, we'll know. Mm. And before that, it's not much use speculating, but this is interesting. And he, and he picked on a rather important point from our point of view, which is that he told Putin that he was making a mistake to describe the Western intervention as crusaders, because, yep. well, that's what Gaddafi is saying. And so he came down rather significantly, as it were, in favour of our view of what's going on, and Putin, I, I don't know what motivated him, but uh, I don't think he should have said that, actually. He's, he's, a, he's a fascinating character, Putin, isn't he? I mean, he refuses to go away. And in a sense, he, uh, he's, he's more, I mean, he's a complete autocrat in many ways, but he's more of a sort of Western-type leader, the, the sort of cult of personality in some ways, than ma- many other form, well, former he leaders. Has, he has very, very high approval ratings, and he's had them for nine years now, yeah. however long it is. And these are genuine. And it's mm. not just, it's partly a cult of personality because they do that in Russia rather, but it's also because he's given them what they want. Now, let's, let's go back to the subject of, of the book. Um, the Russians were there for, for 10 years. When did it dawn on them that they had actually really bitten off more than they could chew? Well, I, I, I mean, they, they had not wanted to stay there very long, so they started talking about getting out very soon. Uh, and then, of course, they found that it wasn't that easy. I mean, they couldn't leave straight away because Kabul was in chaos and they thought they'd better sort that out first. And then, of course, it went on being in chaos. They did make their first approaches to foreigners and to the United Nations within a year. But um, they were up against a number of things, apart from the fact that it's not easy to disengage from a war. Uh, the Pakistanis, the Americans and the Mujahideen were determined that they should leave with ignominy, and that they should not leave their man behind in Kabul. Mm. And, of course, they'd gone in to put their man in in Kabul, and so they couldn't withdraw. When Gorbachev came to power in 1985, he was determined to make things happen. And very soon after, he called the Afghan leader to uh, Moscow, this is 1985, and said, "Um, you better get used to the idea, our soldiers are leaving in a year or 18 months. Uh, just in passing, that was a year before the first stinger was fired. fired. If you've seen Charlie Wilson's War, yeah, I have. it's not entirely accurate. <laughs> oh, really? It's a, it's a sort of good <laughs> film in a way. It's sort of fun, but it's not. So then the problem was, which it always is, and there are records of the Politburo discussions, Gorbachev saying, how are we going to explain that we're leaving? We can't blame it all on our predecessors. And, you know... What is going to happen to our prestige and the prestige of the Soviet army? And why did those boys die? How are we going to explain Mm. that? So, you know, this also has a familiar ring. And uh, in the end, they bit the bullet. They successfully negotiated a withdrawal arrangement. They withdrew in good order. They weren't defeated. Uh, They weren't a defeated army. They withdrew. Um, They left their man behind in Kabul. They did leave their man behind. So the Pakistani and Mujahideen objective they didn't achieve at that point. So the Russians withdrew, and you still get Russian generals saying, well, we won that war, didn't we, just as you get American generals saying they won the Vietnam mm. War. But of course, it's no good having a military 
victory if you don't have a political victory, and they didn't have that. And um, how long did the how long did it take to actually extricate themselves? Well, they the the agreements it was signed in Geneva for their withdrawal in April 1988. And they withdrew in two phases. And the first phase was in the summer of 88, and the second phase was the winter of 88, 89. And they pulled out uh, the final withdrawal was on in February 89. So it was, what's that, nine months, mm. the whole process. And they did it in a very efficient and orderly way. Well, I suppose the obvious question that I have to ask you is, um, why didn't we learn the lessons from it? Well... We could have learned the lesson before. Well, firstly, each time anybody goes into Afghanistan and you say, you know, there are lessons, they say this time it's going to be different. Yeah. So we thought it was going to be different. But actually the, the lesson from the British, I won't go into that, there's not time, but the British actually were quite successful in Afghanistan. But their great discovery was that the best thing you do with Afghanistan once you've achieved something is leave very quickly. And the, the Russians didn't, and we haven't done. My own view is that the moment to leave was in December 2001, after the Americans had beaten the Taliban, mm. beaten al-Qaeda. They should have left saying, uh, you, you watch it. If you start that stuff up again, we'll be back. Mm. But, of course, you know, we're all good-hearted souls, and we thought we can't possibly leave this country, and the message is we must try and help them. And we started helping them in ways that most Afghans don't want us to help them. What, what do you mean by that? Well, a whole lot of things like imposing our view of how a democratic state should run, our view of what the status of women should be, a whole lot of things that Afghans have never done and don't see why they should do so just because a whole bunch mm. of foreigners tell them. And do you think... I mean, I think our motives were very good and I sympathise with them. I just think it was an intractable situation. And when you look at what's starting to happen in Libya now, do, do you see any warning signals there that we might be, we, we haven't defined the end game and therefore we might be drawn into something that might be slightly more complicated than maybe it looks at the moment? Well, I think that's certainly true, but I think there are two things about that. Firstly, that's true of all wars. You go in, uh, you don't know, I mean, that's the whole point of a war. Nobody knows who's going to win until somebody's won it. And the end game is always different from what you hope it's going to be. Second World War we went into in order to save mm. Poland, and look what happened to Poland. Um, so I, I mean, I keep my fingers crossed about Libya, but we don't know what's going to happen. The Arab opinion could well turn against us, which means that it will be yet another war where we're fighting the Muslim world, in their view. And we don't know very much about the Libyan opposition either. So I think... Uh, I think it was, would have been very difficult not to go in in the circumstances, but I, I should be very happy when we get out successfully. Now, I've got to ask you about this. It's not really related to the book, but you were ambassador in Moscow 88 to 92. You presumably got to know Gorbachev reasonably well during that period. Um, what, what was it like being ambassador in, Mo in Moscow at the time that the, the, the Eastern Bloc was crumbling, that perestroika was being brought in by Gorbachev? Well, it was tremendously exciting and a very emotional period because a whole lot of things were possible that had never been possible. We'd been in Russia in the 60s and you, you couldn't really have contact with ordinary people. When we went back, the place was wide open. We could meet everybody from Gorbachev down to peasant women in the villages mm. and talk to them. And, of course, this huge transformation was taking place and it was a very, as I said, emotional moment. And then, of course, the coup against Gorbachev happened. My wife... Who, who did rather tend to join in street demonstrations, was on the barricades during the coup of outside really? the White House when Yeltsin was inside the White House. And uh, um, so, I mean, we, we led a life that most ambassadors don't get the opportunity to lead, and uh, it, was, it was wonderful. Why do the R Russians revile Gorbachev so much? Well, I, th I hope that that will change, because I think what Gorbachev did for us and for them was he was the prime mover in bringing the, the nuclear confrontation to an end, which we should all be extremely grateful for. He, um, I mean, they associate him with the collapse of the Soviet Union, with the near famine that followed, the humiliation, the international humiliation that followed, the chaos and corruption of the years that followed, and they say he was the man who started it, and that's why. I think they're wrong, but, I mean, you can understand mm. it, and it'll take them a long time, I think, to to see him differently, and I think that's a great injustice to him.
Well, thank you very much for joining us on the programme. We're, we're near the end of our time. Uh, that's Sir Roderick Braithwaite, whose book is called Afghansi, The Russians in Afghanistan, 1979-89, to 89, published by Profile Books at £25 in hardback. Now, next week, I'll be talking to Peter Mandelson on the book club. Same time, same day, 9 o'clock on Monday. Tomorrow, I'm off. Alastair Campbell's going to be taking care of you for three hours, and I never thought that's something that I would uh, ever say on the programme, but I'm sure he will be uh, a very capable host for you. Uh, Coming up next is Clive Bull. He's going to have the results of the Libyan vote in the House of Commons, and indeed the vote at midnight when MPs are going to decide whether they should have a pay freeze or not. So that's Clive Bull coming up next. This is LBC 97.3. Hello, I'd like to complain about my room. Yeah? The shower's cold.